This week's episode of Offworld is made possible by Emerald Code on Sorta TV. Emerald Code is a series about teenage friends as they solve problems using STEM concepts. In the latest season, the gang heads off to space camp and conduct some pretty funky experiments. If you're a teacher or a parent, this is an amazing way to get preteens and young women in your life into the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. Emerald Code. Get with the programming. Welcome back to Off World, the show where we talk about all things space exploration and pop culture. I am Ariel Waldman. And I'm Norm Chan. And I think we have a really fun episode for y'all this week. It is a movie that came out over 20 years ago now. Yeah, Starship Troopers. And we have a couple of really, really awesome scientists from the California Academy of Sciences who are here to talk about bugs and kind of be in the bugs defense. I can't wait. Let's take a listen. So today I'm with Dr. Lauren Esposito and Dr. Brian Fisher, but thank you both so much for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so uh, if you could both actually uh, introduce yourselves and say a little bit about what you do, Lauren. I am the Curator of Arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences, and I study the evolution of scorpions, spiders, and their venoms. Awesome. Brian. I do not study scorpions, but I study ants, and I've been studying ants for well, most like 25 years. I love ants. Yeah, well, I mean, they're pretty creepy and awesome, in my opinion. Uh, so we're speaking of creepy and awesome, we're talking about Starship Troopers today, 1997 film, definitely very campy, uh, also a lot of fun, um, most of all for the fact that they depict what they call bugs in the film. Uh, Lauren, what did you think of the depiction of bugs and insects in the film generally? What, what was your feeling as being a sort of a bug expert watching bugs well, I guess, get murdered a lot on film. Well, you know, I, I guess I would say that, that bugs is a really general word. And when I think of the word bugs as a professional entomologist, like the first thing that comes to mind is actually not insects at all, um, or arachnids, but rather like things that make you sick. So initially, before I really like got into the film and knew what was going on and knew what they what they were describing, like I didn't really know what kind of bugs it was. But I will say that I was, that I was, particularly disturbed by the fact that they really villainize these bugs mm -hmm. when really bugs are our friends. And the, the worst part of all was that scene where they're all stomping on the cockroaches and they're like so excited about it. Oh, I just felt so kids. sad. I felt so Those sad in that Those are Malagasy scene. hissing cockroaches. I know. And I, I know. work in Madagascar and I was actually saddened. And they take so long to grow up too. And they're like, like these big adult Malagasy hissing cockroaches. And it was like tra a tragedy for them to be stomped. But they were really excited about it in the movie. And insects are often depicted like that, though. Um, I mean, they're either, maligned. Either insects are invisible to everybody, or all of a sudden they're the most awful thing. It's true. It's yeah, true. so when I uh, explain bugs as being creepy awesome, what would you say instead? Infinite beauty. If you actually take the time to look at one under the microscope, you'll be fascinated. It's like the most beautiful art you could ever imagine. So speaking of art, what did you think of uh, the depiction of, in terms of visuals of, of how these uh, insects were actually uh, shown on the film and sort of, I guess, uh, you know, uh, their size and their colors and, and structure? Well, I, I can imagine the, those who designed it wanted more, but they were a bit limited maybe by their robotic abilities. And but they they look more like robots than insects. But but they had some interesting detail, which I appreciated. Be one who studies ants, they were in, often in groups, working together maybe. Um, that wasn't really shown across very well in the film, but one could imagine if they did have a brain and lots of other casts, worker ants maybe, um, that it was a social society. Yeah, yeah, what did I you guess think? ants are kind of a warring society for that matter. Warring, no, it's, it's just a, a depiction of how, from whose side you're on. So an ant is basically going to defend where they live. You know, they don't have to build a wall. They just actually go out and mark their territories. A chemical wall. A chemical wall, that's <laughs> true. Um, a smart wall. And, and also, when you look at an individual ant, that's not the ant. It's like a leaf on a tree. The ant is actually the collective whole. The organism is called a superorganism, and that was very similar um, to to the film, right? You could kill yeah. one of those workers, and they still kept coming. You know, people always say, "Get the ants out of my house," and they're gonna like, "We gotta kill them." I'm like, "Wake up! There's a billion outside. They're just gonna come in and keep coming in when it gets rainy outside." So, 
killing them is not the right approach. Individually. Individually. So, I mean, we certainly see, you know, uh, all these hordes of, of different um, uh, arachnid-like creatures come in. What did you think of the depiction of arachnids? You know, certainly yeah. we're all sort of familiar with ants sort of having colonies, but what about arachnids in general? Well, uh, what I would say is that it, I, what I really liked about the film is that there's all these different kinds of, of bugs. Um, in the beginning, they like, in one of the first earlier scenes are like in a lab dissecting one like you would do in high school biology or something. And... And it's vastly different from the ones that are that they're combating against initially, and and so there, there was definitely like multiple different kinds of bugs that were depicted, which was I thought was interesting. And each of them, you could see where they drew their inspiration from in nature. Like some of them had kind of beetle heads, and others had sort of sort of like a an, an isopteran or a or a crustacean kind of body, and some of them looked like weevils. But the arachnids, I really have to take issue with because while they were called arachnids, there was nothing arachnid about them. Yeah, so break that down. What was not arachnid about the arachnids? Well, arachnids have a few really like hallmark features that make them an arachnid. The first is that they have eight legs. These guys only had four. So forget it. Already they're not an arachnid, right? Secondly, arachnids have really two major body parts. They have the prosoma, which is like the head, and the epistosoma, which is like the rest of the body. And these guys they really just kind of had one body part with like a mouth attached <laughs> at the front. The other thing that arachnids have that's super important is mouth parts called chelicerae. They're chewing mouth parts. These guys did not have chelicerae. They had just like this giant like, it, it almost looked kind of like a rhinoceros beetle yeah, head, yeah, but yeah. it was like the mouth part, you know, it's just for like grabbing and impaling things. And I guess that's the other thing is that arachnids never really impale. They, they, they sting or they bite, but they don't impale things and then like absorb them instantaneously into their mouth. So arachnids, I'm not really convinced, but bugs, okay. <laughs> you can take them. Well, so an interesting thing about that. So this film, I think, was made like a few years after Jurassic Park and the animation studio who, who worked on it uh, was uh, the same that worked on Jurassic Park. And I think I had read that uh, they made the arachnids have four legs because the computing power to make eight legs was too much in 1997. Yeah, so, I can imagine that. So they're, they're half arachnids, you know. They they're tried. half arachnids. But <laughs> kind of like Brian said, like they look sort of robotic. It almost looked like they had these four legs and then on top of it, almost like a almost like a tank was this like pivoting body that like pivoted on top of all four legs. Arachnids really, their legs come into their into their prosoma, into their head, and all those muscles like come around inside of their head. And so it's really all integrated into one seamless seamless feature well so let's talk about the the size of the <laughs> bugs also well, like we've ignored which, them yeah yes. i mean that's like the pretty huge thing of you know what if these killer bugs in outer space uh, were really really big uh which made me want to ask uh you all about you know how large have bugs insects arachnids uh gotten in the history of earth you know we we usually associate them with being very fairly small although recently in the news there's been the uh the super bee or or huge bee that was uh, rediscovered mm -hmm. um you know how how large have insects gotten in the history of earth have they gotten that large have they gotten close to that large well, I'll let Brian talk about the insects, but I can tell you arachnids, at least the ancestors of modern day arachnids, were huge. There was this thing called a eurypterid, which is uh, informally called a sea spider or a sea scorpion. And these things were massive. They were like two meters long. They were really like the grizzlies of the ocean. They were predators. And, and it was these eurypterids that first started coming on the land and became amphibious. And, and it's been hypothesized that they were actually going up into rivers and eating salmon out of, out of rivers, just like grizzlies do today. So they oh were really God. huge. I would say not quite as big as the arachnids <laughs> in, the, in the film, but they were certainly a meter or two in length. But wow. those were in the ocean. And so that explains. Indeed. One limitation of an exoskeleton is that it's heavy, but if you're in the ocean, you got some buoyancy, and maybe on these planets, the gravitational pull is less, so they could support a larger exoskeleton. Plus the oxygen levels. And that's the other point, why and when in our history on Earth, we've had large insects. And it really determines their ability to absorb enough you know, oxygen to actually... Um, keep everything working with muscles. And grow because do all, all insects passively respire like yeah, arachnids? Passively. Yeah, passively. Yeah. So they passively, they don't have a lung, so they have to be able to, so if you increase the percentage of oxygen in the air, you can actually um, absorb it quicker, and then you can be a bigger insect. So in the past, you've had much larger insects. Um, you've had even ants that were like this big. Whoa. Yeah, even you can, we have great fossil deposits in Colorado and Wyoming and see them. But I think like the largest 
fossil insect is like it's a dragonfly. A dragonfly right? Yeah, it's like yeah, and it was like a, I think like a meter wingspan, something like that. Maybe not that big, but almost that big. It's like, well, the wings. Yeah, the, the wings, wings aren't. Okay. The wings yeah, don't, I mean, don't need any oxygen. And in the it's movie, we, we see uh, these wasp-like, dragonfly-like sort of creatures yeah. come in as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's like the evolution, right? Right. So yeah. let's look at it from an evolutionary point of view, which is like to me the most interesting part. So convergence is a common scenario in our world, which is what? Earth. Convergence would be, for example, you drop some living thing into an isolated island like Madagascar, and then it just evolves in to be something very different and fill the niches that maybe other insects or animals fill in Africa. And that's an example of where you have this kind of radiation and it takes on different roles. So if um, you have this great kind of like strategy of filling niches called the arachnid morphotype, but this time it has four legs because of some historical scenario. The arachnid morphotype being a part of her. A predator, right? All right. And, uh, I'll take that. And then it just actually then sets off and evolves. Now, now obviously, um, niches have to be filled. Now, the question is, on the planet, what niche are these filling, right? Because they don't seem to have anything to eat unless humans are there. It's pretty well, But there are those other bugs. Those other bugs are there. But they seem to be all working together. Yeah, it's because true. they the, ate the, all those the... other bugs up. But then what are the other bugs eating? <laughs> you know what? It might have been a thriving planet before these things evolved and got out of control. You know what? Maybe it's really like a metaphor for humanity. <laughs> there are a lot of metaphors in this movie, uh, some of which we're not going into today. But uh, I certainly appreciate like all the propaganda visuals and just overtones of this movie, which is a bit nuts. Um, although they don't really, you know, to both of your points, they don't really paint these insects in a very sort of um, sympathetic light. You know, they. I would say it's damaging for insect reputations. Yeah. But, hey, but it's not just them. It's constant. Even the BBC does that when they do like planet Earth. <clears throat> they'll show you beautiful scenarios of penguins. In the next scene, they'll show you locusts in Madagascar and say, oh, evil, we're going to help kill them. Here we've teamed up with the pesticide company to go out and kill them. I'm like, excuse me, the, na the locals um, eat edible insects and locusts are one of the most nutritious foods in Madagascar. And abundant. Yeah. And abundant. Well, so getting back to the whole thing about, you know, other planets. So you could imagine, uh, based on the history of Earth and, and life as we know it, that there may be other planets in our galaxy, uh, just uh, imagining that have, if they have a lot more oxygen than we do in their atmosphere, that the that there are potentially planets that could have uh, bugs and insects that get as large or close to as large as we see in the movie. So it's not entirely made up that insects could actually get this large. No, I mean, I think that, that it's conceivable that somewhere in the universes, there's another planet that is similar enough to Earth in that it contains oxygen and has the similar kinds of habitats like oceans and land and things that are primary producers like our equivalent of plants and then something eating those like our equivalent of ants. And then something that's that, that comes along that evolves convergently, so it's it's evolving to occupy a similar space as our arachnids that's just really giant because it's prey is giant and what the prey is eating is also giant because of increased levels of oxygen or some other kind of chemical because the body plan of insects solves a problem very efficiently one it takes low input so it doesn't waste energy on heat um, and, and requires less water but also because the, the 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 skeletons on the outside and the muscles are on the inside and that provides a lot of like Newtonian advantage. You get great leverage. You can be, you can lift more for your size, and it just works so much better. In fact, it's a, in many ways a uh, superior body plan than than putting your muscles on the outside and your bones on the inside. And then something on top of all of that, like your skin, to hold it all in. Like yeah. this is just like killing two birds with one stone. So, so on that, so do you think uh, insects and bugs are really amenable to uh, living in extreme conditions that we might see on other planets or moons? And, you know, uh, uh, in the news a lot is uh, tardigrades for their ability to, you know, be all over the earth like many mm -hmm. insects are, uh, but also for their ability to survive the vacuum of space uh, for uh, at least a few days and then come back and be unfazed. Yeah. Do, do some insects have that ability as well? I mean, let's, let's just talk about arachnids because they are arachnids after yeah. all. So just, just taking scorpions, which is a kind of arachnid. There's scorpions in caves uh, 100 meters below sea level and there's scorpions in the Alps. There's scorpions in 
every ecosystem on Earth with the exception of the Arctic and Antarctica. So I think that that just goes to show that, that in just this one organism, it's persisted for 450 million years on this planet. It is really, really good at adapting to incredibly harsh environments from the driest desert to the most humid tropical forest, all the way up to like cold freezing temperatures that where there's almost permafrost year round. So, so just in this one example of arachnids, and there's there's lots of different kinds of arachnids. There's spiders, there's mites, there's there's daddy long legs or harvest men we we call them. So that's that's just talking about arachnids. Never mind all the insects, which which outnumber the arachnids by far in terms of both the the diversity, the different kinds that are out there, but also like sheer number. Yeah. So it's it's their ability to manage those extreme points, because in, even in the um, Alps, there's days where it's like, you know, the tropics. It's really hot outside, and that's the. They can just take advantage of that by shutting down, in a sense, during the coldest periods. And that ability to shut down is thanks in part to having their skeleton on the outside and being able to close off all their um, places they breathe and just kind of almost hibernate for a few hours even. But others can actually throw antifreeze through their whole body and, and survive. They through. like produce it, essentially. They produce their own antifreeze and they can survive. So there's all these, like re I think, really ingenious, for lack of a better word, adaptations that we see in insects and arachnids just here on this planet that, that I would say are, would allow them to withstand some incredibly harsh conditions like I would imagine on, on other planets. But then again, maybe other planets are like quite nice and luxurious and we really don't know, I guess, is the end of the... <laughs> Maybe it's best that we don't know. We don't learn that we're like, oh, man, we could have been on that other planet. It's really... It's like mosquito-free. Yeah. It's... Well, I think planet Earth is beautiful. <laughs> it is. It is. I agree. And it's Fully. losing its charm in some places, thanks to us. But um, it is our, be our beautiful blue planet. Well, so part of the beauty to me in, in uh, animals and insects are, uh, you know, their intelligence. And I think we oftentimes uh, underestimate their intelligence or don't really uh, recognize in, uh, intelligence in other creatures or sometimes like othering of intelligence. So mm -hmm. uh, the intelligence that we see in the film, uh, you know, we see the... Um, a lot of different uh, species working together. We see this huge brain bug that they're trying to service. That's sort of like a queen bee analog. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what sorts of intelligence did you see in the film? Uh, and, and how does that like hold up to intelligence as, as you see in, in your studies? That's an interesting question because um, ants and others make a great example of, of, of comparing the two. So in ants, you have uh, high intelligence, you could say which means they can communicate. And I didn't really see much communication going on in the film with, and with the brain and uh, the other species. And it could be that they, they're just different casts. It could just be the same species we saw. And just like ants, they've evolved to have some that are the soldiers and mm -hmm. some that are the little workers and stuff. And that's the brilliance of ants. People say ants are so great because they're, they're, they work together like a family, if they're social, but it's actually more than that. It's, it's incredible because they have um, different sizes. You can have a large ant and a small ant, and it could be almost a hundred times in size difference. And this that difference is allows them to actually take on different jobs, just like we saw in the film. It's like cooperative intelligence. It's cooperative intelligence and, and division of labor intelligence. And you know that if you took a, an ant colony and counted all the neurons in it, um, it'd be about as many neurons as a human. So That's in terms awesome. of neural capacity, an ant colony is about as much as a... a a human, but that brain had a big brain in the movie, yeah. and that's a lot of neurons in there. Before we continue on with this week's episode, I want to let you know that Offworld is made possible with support from Emerald Code on Sorta TV, an amazing show for teachers and parents. We know how hard it can be to get the younger people in your life to embrace STEM fields, especially young women. Emerald Code is a series that really focuses on helping younger people grow their interest in STEM by showing how they can use these concepts to solve problems in real life. The series provides great role models for young people who might be a bit shy about stepping into scientific communities they're interested in. Check out Sorta TV for lots more STEM content, like their DIY experiment show, Stemily and Decoded, which focuses on real girls making a difference in STEM fields. 
Subscribe to the Sorta TV channel at youtube.com slash Sorta TV, or if you're watching the video, by clicking the links in the description below. Once again, that's youtube.com slash S-O-R-T-A TV. Now back to the conversation. Yeah, well, what about with arachnids? Do you see as many like community sort of based intelligence or not so much? In gen generally speaking, co arachnids are not cooperative. They live individually and maybe come together for the purposes of, of reproduction. So in some cases, males and females will raise eggs semi-cooperatively. Um, often we see things like maternal care where the mom's taking care of either the eggs or the eggs and the babies once they hatch or the eggs and the babies once they hatch and after they grow up for a while. So we see that kind of cooperation. We don't see ever see the level of cooperation or uh, or collective intelligence like we do in ants and other social insects. But I mean, I think that there's, that there's certainly some clear indication that there's an intelligence present in the tiny little cluster of neurons that we call a brain and arachnids. For example, there's a jumping spider that lives in Australia and, and it feeds on mosquitoes only. It's just a mosquito eater. But this, this uh, little arachnid actually prefers to eat mosquitoes that have been blood fed. So it's able to detect blood-fed mosquitoes and then preferentially eat them. And it, and it doesn't do this from birth. It actually learns that it prefers to feed on these hmm. blood-fed mosquitoes. Does it learn through itself or through watching others? Or? It's unclear whether it learns on its own just from eating or whether it learns from watching others. But, it, but we know that it prefers to eat blood-fed mosquitoes if it's experienced blood-fed mosquitoes. And we see this all the time, this kind of like learning where, where arachnids... Um, learn to modify their behavior based on past experiences. So I just I was just listening to a presentation last week at a arachnology conference. Um, and this one was about whether certain spiders prefer to live with to, or sorry to live with to mate with with male spiders that look like their father <laughs> or to mate with male spiders that look like a, a, a different kind of variation on the morphology. Okay. And it turns out that they prefer to mate with the ones that they see another female mating with. Right. So if they first see a female mating with, like, they're contained, right? So they mm -hmm. can just see, like, through glass. Yeah. They can see a female mating with one kind of, of male, like, color or size or whatever. Then they'll, once they be reach sexual maturity, they'll prefer to mate with that male. So it's actually, like, de a clear demonstration of learning behavior in arachnids. Oh. Just like the ones in the movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, so uh, there was a lot of depiction in the movie of different weaponry that sort of these, these, uh, creatures have and we see things like uh, a fi almost a fire breathing beetle. Oh no no something like that. That, <laughs> that, that was clearly a bombardier beetle, right? Right? That's, That's exactly uh, what I was no thinking. Fire. It's clearly it's chemicals. Two, two chemicals, chemicals sprayed together and they just blow up. That's okay. exactly. That's real. That's, that's real. real. Oh, that's it doesn't real come thing. out of their mouth. You have to explain that then. What <laughs> what happens in real life with these beetles? It's well, not like, just the bombardiers, there's the post signs who do the same thing, but the bombardiers are the classic famous ones where as a defense they throw two chemicals together and those explode. And they basically like push them out of the, the air holes in the side of their body. So they have like little glands and right next to the, where their air holes are. Um, and they just kind of like push them out and it sprays this chemical out into the, into the air when they're like getting attacked. And, and it's it like chemical, explodes? it's chemical yeah. burn, it's acid. Oh, it's wow. Acid. Ants do it too. There's a kamikaze ant that blows itself up when it's uh, being attacked to take down its predators with it. Um, it's pretty amazing. Well, that's kind of cool. So, you know, we talked about how the impaling and everything wasn't very realistic. Well, but the impaling is realistic for some things. Yeah, pierce, piercing sucking mouth parts are the usual tool for, for piercing. And when they... When they went into the brain, uh -huh. that was classic. Reduviidae. It's a Which bug is... that has a piercing, sucking mouth part that goes into its prey. It's called the kissing bug. The kissing oh, bug. lovely. Or the yeah. assassin bugs. Yeah. Okay. So they definitely chose their... And I've actually, <laughs> I've actually seen one uh, sitting on a leaf with, with a, another kind of bug, a little plant bug, impaled through its rostrum, mm. through its beak. Oh, my God. It was, it's terrifying. That, yeah, that does sound terrifying. So what other weapons did we see sort of in the movie? We saw... Well, they have oh, this yeah. kind of like crazy beak mandible thing. And for me, when I saw those, I just thought Hercules beetles. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because they have these horns that they use for male-male combat, actually. So, th so they use them in sparring. Um, and it's, it's for, they spar over access to females, which don't have horns. Um, and, and that's the first thing I thought when I saw those, those like big horn kind of mouth parts. You see, because as we're explaining in morphology, function is often depicted in the morphology, right? So the muscle attachments and, and its function you can get from looking at it. But there's one thing I couldn't figure out 
looking at the brain. Mm -hmm. How does it reproduce? Like maybe it wasn't all brain and it was just all reproductive. Like it could have been organs. ovaries. Yeah, it could have been just a egg a thing laying. It could be like a giant termite or a, yeah. a queen ant. It, it kind of looked eggs. like a giant termite. Yeah, and we also saw um, again beetle-like ones that had um, like fire uh, fire bug firefly sort of back ends that like sort of lit up and then lit up the sky with mm. firework like weapons or something. Oh, I think that was. Oh yeah, I think that was the the. Bombardier beetle, but there was another example right in the beginning one. that was actually uh, throwing spores, oh, like right, to colonize yes. other planets oh, yeah, or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, which is a big part of the whole plot of the movie is you know this whole like are they attacking us? You know, I guess we have to go attack them and uh, all the propaganda associated with that. And I don't know, like uh, to my knowledge, I don't know of any any insects that reproduce kind of like spawnily like that but because insects are really just crustaceans they did at some point reproduce spawnily yeah, yeah kind of one. not too far off base okay so my final question for both of you is what sort of bugs in space movie would you like to see we talked a lot about how this sort of demonizes bugs a lot and insects and what sort of bugs in space movie would you like to see or, or what sort of aspects would you like to be illuminated about the reality of uh, many insects and arachnids I mean, I, personally, I like this movie. Like, I think it's great. It's hilarious. It's <laughs> like, there's a lot going on. There's lots of things to laugh about. And, and certainly, there's a lot of, of depiction of these animals that's, that draws from nature, even if it's not entirely accurate. But that's, that's like what imagination is, right? It's the best, I think, many of the best aspects of our imagination are drawing from real life. Like, the scariest movies, like Alien, Predator, anything like that. It draws from nature. Like I see that, and as an entomologist, as an arachnologist, I know exactly what they were looking at when they first designed this. But, but you know, I, I, I guess like I, I would be hard pressed to say what I would like to see in a movie. What do you think? I don't know if you took it as if you took bugs from Earth and then they went to space. What would they evolve into? What kind of societies and and like niches? an experiment gone wrong? Yeah, well. like like yeah. So we took. Insects from, but I had this idea that, you know, life is just like almost DNA that's being thrown around everywhere. You know, some DNA sticks, some DNA doesn't. So we're, Earth is spewing DNA out. And it could be in the form of bugs. It could be in the True. form of arachnids. They, they resist a lot. So maybe it's a scorpion because it just resists everywhere. It just they gets do. spewed out and it's just floating through space, you know. They are good Floating rafters. through space and then it lands on this nice juicy planet. Ah, this is lovely. And what's going to happen next? Well, if it's a female, then it's pregnant. It has babies. And it has babies. And then this is the beginning of a great movie. She's going to change her career, and now it's going to direct a new movie on... <laughs> Scorpions in Space. Scorpions, Scorpions, Scorpions in Space. space. I would Scorpions. totally, totally watch that. Well, thank you both so much for being on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Ariel, when you said you wanted to do an episode about Starship Troopers, there are so many space-related things in that film. Is it the hyperdrive system? Is it politics in the future? And you chose bugs, yeah. and that was super interesting. Yeah, bugs in space, I think, is a pretty awesome topic. And to have two people who actually specialize in bugs talking about all the things that were realistic and not was really, really fascinating because there was just tons of stuff that I was like, clearly that's fake. That doesn't happen in real life. And they're like, oh, no, that's a real bug. Right, right, because you think that as the filmmakers when they made the film, that you know they were probably inspired by bugs, but they took a lot of liberties. And... They took it seriously. You're, like you talked about how there were true things. Like it wasn't just dismissed as a, a silly movie character or plot point. Yeah, it, it actually made me appreciate Starship Troopers that much more because I felt that they, you know, did as good as they could. And I feel like even though it's a film from 1997, it still absolutely holds up because everything's sort of done in the same visual uh, consistency, and and everything sort of just is held together really well. So I, I think it's a good film. If, if you haven't watched it recently to rewatch it, it holds up well. I think before we started recording, we talked we talk about the, the, the kids stomping on the bugs being a, a tragic moment that I did not empathize with that when I first watched the movie. And now I, I think I've come all the way around. Yeah. So yes, I, I would not Don't kill the bugs. On those specific Madagascar cockroaches. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Well, thank you so much for listening to the episode or watching the episode. Off World uh, is available as a podcast as well. Uh, if you don't know, you can also find it at tested.com slash Off World uh, with our whole library of episodes. And we'll be back next time with another Space Talk.